Hello everyone and welcome to today's class on Zara and uh, we'll be discussing their agile supply chain. This case study is a fascinating case study because it focuses on Zara's supply chain and Zara's is you know about a 40 um, four year old company and it is the third biggest retailer in the world. It, it manufactures clothing and it has a fascinating story because it revolutionized um, the fashion world as we know it today. I hope you enjoy the case study. I will be taking you um, through the entire story of Zara's. We'll be taking a, a very close look at their supply chain um, from various aspects. And so I hope you enjoy the journey. Okay, I'm gonna start off by giving you um, <clears throat> Just a little bit of just a little bit of, of an overview about the fashion industry overall. So there was, you know, a big shift in the fashion industry when clothing started getting manufactured. <clears throat> excuse me, in China, and uh, this basically was a big move uh, for the fashion industry because it significantly reduced the cost of goods but that in itself was not necessarily enough um, subsequently what happened is you know with entrants such as Zara's the speed at which goods were being bought to the customer also became important so it wasn't just how cheap clothing was it was also how quickly um, new designs could be brought to the customer that became extremely important now Nowadays, uh, before we jump into the case study, I want to talk a little bit about what clothing means to the consumer. In the olden days, clothing was used just to protect the body from you know, the cold or the extreme heat, and um, that was pretty much it. But nowadays, clothing has basically symbolizes um, an individual style, and it supports a, person, a person's personality. So the whole idea of clothing has changed over time. A couple of other important things to keep in mind that in the fast fashion business world of today, um, supply chain management is a key success factor. So companies that have good supply chain management in the fashion industry have an edge and um, they really um, are able to prosper. And it, it's not only just the manufacturing supply chain that has to be good. End to end, everything in the supply chain needs to be um, managed in the best way possible. And so the final product that you uh, are, uh, that the fashion industry offers consumers is a combination of timing, of, of get, getting them the right clothes at the right time, the right place. The clothes should be in the right form and um, they should be very functional. So the style matters, um, the functionality matters as well. Now, after this, I'm going to talk again a little bit about another um, interesting supply chain concept before we dive into the actual case study and learn about Zara's. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about something called agile supply chain. Now, agile supply chain is a network's ability to consistently identify and capture business opportunities more quickly than rivals do. So basically, if there's a com company that's able to quickly identify opportunities and capitalize them, that is a company that is, that is agile. It's quick, it captures opportunities and it maximizes those opportunities. Companies that have agile supply chains are basically always one step ahead of their competitors. They have the ability to do mass customization. So it's not like all of their products are going to be the same. They're, they have the ability to customize products according to customers' requirements. They are very good at dealing with change. Any change that's happening, let's say the customer's demands are changing, they are able to quickly understand that and capitalize on that. They're also very good at dealing with uncertainty. 
So companies that can take an uncertain situation and make it an opportunity rather than a threat are those that are, have agile supply chains. Another big thing that agile supply chains do is that they leverage the impact of people across the enterprise through, through IT. So, you know, very agile supply chains use IT as a big advantage, as a tool. And this tool, especially for companies that are global, um, this IT allows them to really uh, connect with people across the whole company, could be in various locations, and um, basically pass on information that, again, becomes very valuable when you're trying to, um, you know, to react and to uh, basically give the customer exactly what they want. Okay, so after telling you just, you know, going through those four concepts, just a little bit of a high level, you know, high level about the fashion industry in general, about agile supply chains, I'm now going to start telling you about the story of Zara's. So Zara's was established in 1975. It is part of a Spanish group by the name of Inditex. It's owned by a gentleman uh, named by Amancio Ortega. Now, um, within you know two decades or so, this company really took the fashion world by storm. Um, it is now the third biggest retailer in the world. Uh, Mr. Ortega actually was, was at one time the richest man in the world, and he uh, was in competition with Bill Gates, and he, for a while, uh, won the competition and was the most the richest man in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, he came from very humble beginning and he started this fashion brand and, uh, you know, eventually because of its success, um, he, he's really, you know, uh, made this a, a brand that is known globally. Zara's has, um, you know, 3000 in-house designers. All of these designers are based in Spain and, uh, that's their, where their head office is. They design about 40,000 different items a year. That's a big sum of new designs that come out. And of those 40,000, 10,000 are actually selected for um, production. 50% um, um, of their, you know, a big, uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, average industry markdowns in, in the fashion industry are 50%. So there are sales um, a lot of companies give massive sales of up to 50%, but Zara's on the other hand, uh, usually gives, um, you know, sales of no more than 15%. Overall, you know, you can tell Zara's success by one, one key factor, which is that their sales <clears throat> and their profits have been increasing by 20% year on year. And that's a huge amount. Again, um, I mentioned this previously, but they have a presence in 77 countries and in the year 2010, they had 4,907 stores globally. All right, um, now I'm going to tell, talk a little bit about the product organization and design. So prior to Zara's entry in the fashion circuit and um, prior to its become, taking the fashion world by storm, usually big fashion companies would uh, have two, they would make two big collections a year. Um, so one would be released, you know, around summertime, and that would be, uh, you know, they would basically be showing, showcasing their winter collection. And in winter, they would be showing their summer collection. And so at the fashion shows, big buyers would come and identify what designs they would like. Um, so it was just, you know, again, the designs were re being rolled out just twice a year. And uh, the designers would spend a significant time amount of time designing their uh, collections. They would be, they would interpret designs, they would make mood boards, they would, you know, they would do extensive research to come up with their designs. But what happened is when Zara's came into the fashion circuit, uh, they started doing something a little different. They started copying and imitating the high end brands. And so, um, you know, instead of innovation, they were basically just imitating. 
And um, a lot of the Zara's, uh, you know, designers would go and, you know, they would go to the, the various fashion shows, big fashion shows in the world. They would look at, um, you know, various blogs and they would interpret the existing fashion. So rather than creating fashion, they were interpreting the existing fashion. And um, they really were not um, interested in predicting what the next fashion would be. Um, that uh, they left it to others to do. The only thing that they would really predict is um, the fabric that they would buy. And so uh, the only thing that they would really move, you know, take it buy in advance was the fabric, the raw material. And um, usually they would buy white, um, white colored fabric in bulk. Um, and the reason they would buy it in bulk is that, you know, they would, and they would buy it in advance and in bulk is that they would wait for the global prices to go at a low level. And as soon as they would be able to, you know, they caught a spot where it was the, the price of the material was low, they would go ahead and buy in, in bulk. And um, once it was bought in bulk, then based on the design, based on what the trends are, they would um, have it colored or they would have it printed. So that's how they, you know, they were, that's how they were doing um, their production organization and design. There were certain activities that uh, they were doing in-house and there were certain activities that, you know, they have been doing and they are currently, you know, outsourcing. So what they would do in-house is, uh, you know, number one, they would do all the designing. So um, as I mentioned just a little while ago, their head office is in Spain and uh, they have you know, uh, 30,000 different designers. All the designing would be done, is, is done in-house and then samples or also called prototypes are made in-house. Um, additionally, you know, all fabric cutting is done in-house. Uh, but after that, as far as the sewing goes and the, you know, um, additional cutting and, and all of that goes that and dyeing. Um, so uh, all the dyeing that is done for, of the fabric, that is all outsourced um, to small little boutique firms um, within Spain. One thing to also mention about um, how uh, Zara's uh, organizes, its, organizes its production is that it uses a lot of barcode scanners and recently I went to a store and now they actually have RFID tags. So they're moving uh, pretty fast along the technological uh, curve. So, um, and because that they use barcoding and they use RFIDs, uh, they really don't make a lot of errors. Um, and uh, they're very good at picking and sorting items. Okay, next I'm going to talk to you a little bit about procurement and what procurement basically means is buying material and uh, going out and so, so basically there are different words that are attached to this, to procurement. Um, another word for procurement is also sourcing. And so um, this department at Zara's actually interacts with every single um, unit in the organization. And so, um, so many times the procurement department in companies works in a silo and isolation. That's not the case in Zara's. They actually have a lot of interaction across the company. Um, they are involved with buying raw material components, sub-assembly spares, equipment, services, and uh, consumables. Now, the price of materials, you know, definitely changes over time and it has a very big impact on the company's profitability. So this is, the procurement department is extremely important. It also has an impact on the overall quality of the good. Nowadays, um, you know, Zara's understands that customers want a lot of variety in the products and so the short, the life like the whole total life cycle of a product right from the, you know when it's introduced to, to when it's taken out of the market has reduced a lot um so you know um, um there will be a product that zara's will introduce and you know it will be in the market for for a couple of weeks and then it will just not be, they will not be making more of that product so it has a short life cycle um and they make the goods in nowadays a certain style 
every style will be made in smaller quantities and they, their aim is to give you know, a wide variety of options to uh, co consumers uh, to choose from. So a um, couple of things about procurement. Um, there are two aspects of procurement that are extremely important. One is the strategic procurement. And uh, the strategic procurement is, you know, buying the right things in the right quantity at the right time, at the right price, and basically having a high level strategy about what kind of, uh, you know, people you want to be working with. Who, who all do you want in, to um, buy from? And so previously, you know, uh, companies would just go and look for suppliers that would be um, able to provide them goods at really low prices. Nowadays, pricing is not the only aspect that is looked at. Um, there are a lot of aspects that are looked at when deciding on which supplier uh, companies want to work with, um, such as their you know, factories, the environment, the quality of goods, dependability, a lot of various aspects. And so at Zara's, they do um, really try to make sure that the strategic procurement, that the procurement that's being done is in alignment with the overall organization strategy. Um, they, they have a close, they closely assess the supply mar suppliers market. They have a very robust system of choosing the right suppliers to work with. They have, you know, they negotiate supplier contracts. They're constantly checking um, on the supplier, you know, making sure that the quality of goods is consistent. And um, they really work towards, you know, managing their relationships very well with suppliers. And also they try to make sure that, uh, you know, best practices are implemented throughout the supply chain. So that's more of the high level, right? Like, okay, deciding who you want to work with. But um, procurement also has a lot of, you know, tactic, has a very tactical aspect to it. So there's a lot of things that need to be managed on a daily basis. Um, you know, the procurement department needs to make sure that um, there is the right amount of materials available to, uh, for manufacturing. Because if, if the materials aren't available, the supply chain will be broken and materials and you know, goods won't be able to be manufactured. They also have to manage the cost and they have to make sure that the cost is kept as low as possible. And another thing is that they need to make sure that they uh, manage the inventory. So they really don't want to have a huge amount of materials lying available at their factory because you know, a huge inventory as we've discussed in several, uh, several times um, in the previous lectures, big inventory means that a lot of the company's money gets stuck. And that's not a good situation. And so um, this can also lead to losses. So they, their aim is, you know, three big aims from an operational point of view, you know, manage, making sure that the right amount of goods are available, the costs are low, and that the, they minimize the inventory. But um, those are the high level goals, the high level operational goals. But in order to do all of that, they need to do a lot of things day to, on a day-to-day -day basis. They need to prepare forecasts of all the material that needs to be um, procured. They need to understand the demand trends, um, get authorization to make the purchases, actually get the purchasing done, communicate regularly with suppliers, um, take care of all administration, delivery, tax, regulatory issues, monitor the shipments, um, you know, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, if you're importing, exporting, dealing with all of that. And also another big thing is providing regular uh, feedback to suppliers. So they actually have, that's a lot of work that the procurement department does, but it's very important to understand how Zara's, uh, Zara's approach basically for procurement, because again, Zara's is known to have one of the best supply chains. And so um, you know, through this case study where we get an opportunity to understand all the right things that they are doing. Okay, next I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the production uh, um, at Zara's and, you know, how, how they do their production, um, what are the key things that they look at, all of that. I'm going to have, give you an overview of that. So as far as the actual production of the designs, um, there are three aspects that uh, they, they basically, um, you know, focus on. The first thing is that 
they want to maximize the amount of resources that are used. So whatever resources they have in their organization, they want to make sure that those, are, those resources are, are being used in the best way to make the products. They want to make sure that they, um, another big focus that they have is to minimize inventory. And I just discussed that a little while ago. Um, so the inventory, uh, you, they definitely don't want a lot of inventory of the materials that they're, they're procuring. But they also don't want a lot of, you know, finished goods, uh, manufactured goods lying in their factory that are not being able to be sold. So they, their aim is to sort of minimize the amount of inventory that they hold. And one of their, the third aims is to minimize the lead time or minimize the time it takes for them to um, get a good manufact designed, manufactured and in the hands uh, in in the hands of the consumer. So they want to reduce their overall cycle time. So those are the three big aims that Zara's really has. And um, if, if and when you know, any company is able, in the fashion industry is able to do these three things, um, it really leads to an increase in customer satisfaction, lower uh, prices of goods, and an increase in profit. So it's a win-win situation. This in production, if you're able to, to sort of make sure that all three of these things are being done, then you know, you're in a winning situation. Um, and again, uh, um, all right, so uh, moving forward, the factors in uh, product manufacturing are complexity and uncertainty. So that's, you know, there are certain challenges, right? In when you're doing manufacturing, um, there are the, the big challenges that you have is number one, the complexity. It's you know, you're getting a lot of things made. Uh, every every product that you're getting made has a different supply chain requirement. Um, and that makes it complex. Also, when you're running a global supply chain, you are having to um, make things for and have things shipped all over the world. And you're also sourcing a lot of uh, materials from all over the world. So obviously there is a big aspect of complexity as far as production goes. And there's also a very big challenge of uncertainty. So your designers could uh, really have done their research and they could have really done everything right, but there's still an aspect of uncertainty. For example, um, we're dealing with the coronavirus right now. So, you know, you could have, you know, you as a company, a fashion company, you could have done everything right. But because of an external event, you may not be able to sell your goods. So these are just some challenges that, you know, in general, um, companies face with regard to production. At Zara's, 80% um, of the products that they have are core products. And these are products that are, um, you know, they're, they're year-round products. For example, jeans um, or, you know, T-shirts. Um, these are, so for those products that are their core products, they get those products made in China. And the reason is that, you know, if there is a delay um, in getting them, the cycle time doesn't need to be really short. Um, you know, even if it takes a little bit longer, that's fine. Um, they can buy in larger quantity because they are the core products that, again, as I mentioned, they have in their store year round. But they also at Zara's have fast, fast fashion products. And these are the products that really give Zara's an edge. This accounts for 20% of the products at Zara's. And uh, these goods, the fast fashion goods, the, the goods that are you know, based on the most recent trends, these, are, these goods are manufactured primarily in Portugal and Spain. And um, usually uh, what Zara's does in order to minimize its uncertainty, because as I just mentioned, you know, there could be a series of external events that happen. Uh, what they really do is that they make their, um, their clothing line in a limited range and they make, you know, basic shapes. So they don't really manufacture a big lots of one design. They'll manufacture a small amount um, they'll, they'll have it shipped quickly to various stores. Um, they'll get a response and then they will, um, you know, make another lot according to what's happening in the market. So they don't believe in really, you know, production in huge lots um, in advance. 
Um, I also mentioned this a little while ago, but at Zara's, there are product markdowns, meaning there are discounts. Um, when things don't sell, they do have sales. But generally speaking, um, other big fashion companies give huge sales. They give up to 50% um, sales, whereas Zara's gives, you know, around about 15% sales uh, discounts, which is significantly lower. Okay, uh, next up, I will now be talking to you a little bit about the product distribution at Zara's. And uh, this basically means, you know, how is it, how do they, how do they get the goods to all of the different 77 countries um, into their different stores? Um, how is it, how is it really done? Because, you know, honestly speaking, if you, you know, the delivery time it does impact a company's image. If goods are being, um, you know, delayed, um, there's a certain product that a customer is waiting for and it's, it's delayed for a very long period of time, that does impact a, a company's um, image. So, um, and, and, you know, there are certain um, studies that say that if a product is not available for a customer and the customer goes to a store, then you know, twenty percent of customers will walk away and never come back to that store. Um, so you know, this is something that a lot of companies are very sensitive about, making sure that goods are available, you know, at the stores when the customers want them. Uh, Zara's has, you know, this is one area where Zara's has is just impeccable. They actually have new products coming to their stores twice a week. That's uh, that's, uh, you know, a lot, considering that they have a global supply chain um, to be able to, uh, you know, manage to get two new uh, shipments in each one of their stores across the globe is, is quite remarkable. And so because, you know, the customers know that every time they're going to go to the store, they're going to be new products, it really gives the customers a reason to continuously keep going back to the store. Um, when, you know, Zara's actually, when they make their goods, they keep a lot of things in mind. Um, they keep, you know, weather in mind. They keep uh, the customer's requirements, raw material, lead time, a lot of different aspects in mind when they are, um, you know, making their products for customers. But, you know, if you really think about Zara's success, I mean, it's, it's runs a little deeper than just all of this. I mean, they have their hand on the pulse of the customer's requirements. And so let me give you a couple of examples that are mentioned in the case study. In October 2006, there was a movie that came out and uh, it became a big hit. And the movie was on um, a historical figure by the name of Mary Antoinette. And, um, you know, it became a big global, you know, success and everybody was, you know, a lot of ladies were really looking at um, the, uh, the, this movie and in the movie, the, you know, the, the main leads had, you know, very, you know, fashion, old fashioned uh, French designs. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden what, when Zara's realized that this movie has caught the attention of a big global audience, what they did was that they started producing goods that looked similar to the clothes that were in the movie. And um, these were the, these are the kind of, uh, you know, things that Zara does to that really capture the imagination of the audience. And um, it really pulls them in. So they have a very strong pull strategy uh, for as far as fashion goes, rather than a pull strategy. Um, another example of something that goes above and beyond what other companies do, do um, you know, when 9-11 happened in the U.S., um, they, Zara's realized that, you know, there were a lot of people that were suffering um, in the U.S. And there was, generally speaking, a very, it's a very sad time for a lot of people. So what they decided to do was that in their stores, they came up with collections of very dark colors. So all of their collections were in dark grays and blacks and browns. And um, uh, this again, you know, um, really had a good, it, it, it uh, 
you know, it really uh, was something that the customers appreciated. So these kind of things do have been giving, you know, Zara's a very big edge. The other big thing that they have done is this idea of making small batches of goods and then and regularly, very quickly having them ship to stores. This is something that is different from what has ever happened in the fashion industry. And this is effectively what is called fast fashion. And that's why when Zara has introduced this new ideology, you know, um, basically it was, it, they, they saw so much success at Zara's that a lot of the other big fashion houses decided to change their strategy and try to copy what Zara has been doing. Um, but in order to do all of this, obviously you have to have a very good, you know, quick, uh, your designers have to be very good. They have to be very quick. Your prototyping, your, um, you know, actual manufacturing of goods and also your transportation of goods. So all of this has to be very efficient, very, very, very efficient. And if and when you are, you know, like Zara has been able to do all of this, their inventory levels go down. And because of that, their requirement for working capital also goes down and this helps them increase their profitability. All right, next I'll be talking to you a little bit about sales and feedback at Zara's. So um, Zara's uses something called shared situation analysis process in its operations. And what this basically means is that they collect daily, they collect uh, information from the store and they discuss it. So every morning in the head office of Zara's, um, a meeting is held where they have all of their key design designers, they have their key production people sitting there and they all discuss you know, what's happening in the market. And based on that, they decide to um, change, they could decide to change their strategy. <clears throat> if for example, there's a certain category of goods that's been doing very well, they may decide to expand on it. If something is not selling very well, um, they will decrease uh, the production levels. But um, for them, it's this idea of sharing inform information across the supply chain is extremely important in getting feedback from the customer as well. Um, so what they do is they want to make sure that they have you know, constant communication between themselves and the customers and also between themselves and their suppliers. Um, at Zara's, they have a big emphasis on treating all of their suppliers extremely well. And um, this basically helps them perform well as a company. Another thing that is part of this um, shared in, in situational analysis is interpretation of data. So um, what they do is that, you know, at the point of sale, when things are actually being bought um, and scanned, the barcodes are being scanned, there's a lot of information that is captured, which is raw data. Um, you know, it could be the raw data could be, you know, X number of uh, jeans were sold in one day, Y number of red shirts were sold. Um, and so they collect all of this data and um, what they do is they interpret this data and they try to understand, okay, they try to see various patterns and trends from this data. So effectively, this is also known as big data analysis and, um, but that's something that they do. And then once they uh, interpret the data, they come to, up with some conclusions and then they try and test those conclusions. So perhaps they, you know, feel that there, there is an, the, there's an increase in demand for genes. And so they may come up with a new couple of new designs to, of genes and see how they go. So that's uh, basically how it's done. Situational analysis has two parts. One is the quantitative part, uh, quantitative um, uh, section of it, also known as the quantitative approach. And here again, you know, hourly, uh, there are sales and replenishment reports that are sent to the head office from all the different stores. So on an hourly basis, um, you know, what's being sold in each store is being sent, that information is sent to the head office. 
And um, the head office basically then uses this information for uh, making forecasts. But another thing that is also done is, as part of this shared situational analysis is, um, you know, quali a qualitative approach. And here, what happens is that they try, you know, the salespeople, the shop assistants in each of the stores try to get uh, direct customer feedback. And, you know, every day after the store closes, the store manager calls all the salespeople over, the sales assistants, and they try to recall exactly what happened during the day. Um, maybe, for example, there was one design that a lot of people like, but in the changing room, you know, every time people, uh, you know, tried it on, nobody really bought it. And so the salespeople sometimes, you know, would go ahead and ask them, that's, I'm just giving an example, you know, was there anything wrong? Why didn't you buy this? And maybe they said, you know what, the size wasn't right. So various, you know, bits of information like that are collected at the end of every single day. And, um, you know, also there's a good, and that's basically that information is sent to the head office. They also have a very, they keep a very close eye on the unsold items in the fitting room. And again, they try to understand if there are any patterns as to, you know, why things are not being sold, why are people, you know, trying things on, but leaving them in the fitting room. And again, that's valuable information that's sent to the head office. And then the design team uses that to change their strategy accordingly. So um, once this, you know, data is analyzed um, and sent to the head office, the head office then, uh, based on that information, tries to make new designs and new prototypes. And they try to, un based on understanding what the customer requirements are, and then once they make new designs, then those new designs are actually tested out and um, a small amount of them are made. And if they are su successful, if customers actually like them, then they are rolled out on a bigger scale. So the whole idea of actually utilizing, realizing that every single person in the store is very valuable, especially the you know sales assistants are extremely valuable. Um, and taking feedback from everybody in the organization and using it to their advantage is something that Zara's does extremely successfully. All right, a couple of other things that Zara's does is if you ever go to one of Zara's stores, they are actually um, quite beautiful. Uh, everything is, is laid out in a very specific way. The lighting is done in a specific way. There's you know, uh, you know, the music is, is quite standardized. And so at the head office, uh, what happens, what Zara's has done is their head office in Spain, um, they, they have a whole floor that is called the fashion street. And on this, on this floor, they have um, designers that are, you know, um, specialized in merchandising and specialized in how to place goods in a store, in lighting, you know, what colors should be placed next to each other. Um, and so they are, they have a whole team of store design experts. And so um, these store design experts uh, actually try and arrange the, the products that are being made at Zara's and they come up with a very, you know, nice way of how things should be laid out. Um, and not only that, they come up with the specifics about what kind of lighting there should be. Um, what kind of background music there should be, um, or the color of the furniture, everything. And um, they have a whole group, as I mentioned, of architects, visual merchandisers, and designers that really uh, make sure that the layout of the goods is extremely good. Once they decide on what the layout is going to be, they then um, communicate this to all of the stores. And so every store across the globe has to follow the layout that they send so they'll be sending everything all you know and everything is standardized and so you know if you ever go to a, a zara store you'll you'll see that everything is pretty much the same across the globe um, um in zara stores one thing that zara does not do is it doesn't franchise its stores it it basically owns all of its stores a hundred percent and so for them it's extremely important that 
all of their stores um, have a certain brand image and um, they invest in that and they make sure that um, things are, are done in the right way. Okay, um, so that basically brings me to uh, an end of the end of the case study. And, um, you know, I just want to, you know, as the case is being wrapped up, we're going to just, I'm just going to focus on a couple of, of quick things. Uh, one thing to, to really understand as far as Zara's goes is that the entire supply chain process at Zara's is very customer driven. They have, uh, you know, they're not just sitting in a silo and making designs, thinking that maybe this is what the customer wants. They um, listen very carefully to what customers want. They keep an, a, an eye on the best fashion trends in the world, and they do their best to give that to the customers at a very low price and in a good quality uh, level. Um, they collect information in order to make this, you know, customer-driven process efficient um, and effective, they collect information from sales staff, they look at you know, all the leftover material in their stores, any complaints that they get from customers, they don't take it lightly, they actually take those complaints and they, those complaints are forwarded um, to the head office. Um, I can definitely vouch for this. Um, I recently went to a Zara store when I was traveling overseas and um, they had, they didn't have a lot of salespeople in their store. And so the lines were very, very long and, um, you know, several people made complaints. And the next time though, when I did go to the Zara store, the same store, um, they had corrected that mistake and there were a lot more salespeople. So this is definitely something that they do. The second uh, big thing about Zara's is that, you know, the agility. And I spoke about this at the beginning of the lecture as well. And you know the ability to to change according to what customers want, um, and to and, and the whole idea at Zara's is that there's a huge emphasis on reducing the the time. Um, you know, if there's a new design that, that's been you know coming out in the market, um, and it's all over social media, well, Zara's will want to make sure that 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 design is available in their stores as soon as possible. Um, so they are very fast and they're very flexible. Um, they're not very rigid. Um, and, and this is, again, this is the whole idea of agility. And agility is also another word for agility is, you know, flexibility. And so they're flexible. If there's something new in the market, um, they, will, they will change uh, and, and they will deliver what customers want. Um, and, they will, and that's because they are very, very flexible. One other big advantage that Zara's has is that, um, you know, they, they make sure that all of their key people, the designers, the top management, the buying experts, they're all together in their head office. And again, they have a lot of communication. As I mentioned a little while ago, they have daily meetings where all of the top people are sitting together. They can make quick decisions and, um, and that's, that's very helpful for them. So, you know, those are two aspects I just mentioned. And again, this is the summing up section, right? So we've done the, the case study and, as I, and we're looking at the results of, of Zara's right now. And as I mentioned, the, it's, you know, being customer driven, huge advantage, having an agile supply chain, another huge advantage. The third one is the retail uh, power. And so what Zara's does is, you know, it does not just give its franchise to somebody else to, to uh, you know, it doesn't just say, okay, like for example, McDonald's has a franchise. So McDonald's has, um, you know, its head office in the US, but they sell their, they basically are, are willing to franchise their restaurant to a local party to run in, in, in let's say Pakistan, for example. Zara's doesn't do that. Um, wherever they have a presence, they own the store. And so um, this basically, helps them make sure that they have a strong focus on the supply chain, on all aspects of the store. Um, and so they are able to maintain their quality pretty much across the board. And they, they doesn't really, there's not a lot of um, you know, difference if you go to a store in one country versus another. So this is the retail power that they have 
um, kind of held on to. Okay, and um, you know, the fourth point um, of that's really given them, that does give them a competitive edge is their amazing relationship with suppliers. And the suppliers are obviously, I mean, they're working, they, Zara's is working under a lot of pressure because they're trying to really, you know, be flexible, be fast, um, provide goods, keep the cost really low, all of those various things. But, you know, they have, they, they, they also have a good relationship with their suppliers. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, all of these, these, this, they understand, they have a collaborative approach and, and that helps them remain extremely competitive. Also their own supply chain, um, again, is something fast and flexible. They are um, supplying goods twice a week in their stores. And um, this keeps, this keeps customers very interested and they keep coming back for new designs. Zara's in general um, is always looking at ways to eliminate stages in the supply chain. And um, this is something that they, they're always looking at how to make their supply chains more efficient. This continuous improvement approach gives them an edge. Just to give you an example again, Zara's, you know, previously in the fashion industry, there were only two seasons, as I mentioned earlier in the case study. There was a, you know, a summer collection and a winter collection. Now at Zara's, there are 20 collections that are rolled out in a year. And um, that means, you know, there are up to 40,000 new designs made, 10,000 new designs actually get manufactured. And that's something that has, has never really been done before. And so they've basically broken the tradition of the two season model. And this again has given them a huge edge. So um, if you look at it, you know, the, it's not only the supply chain at, at Zara's that is very agile, but in fact, the entire organization is very agile and work, is working extremely efficiently. Um, and by using, you know, a quick response, Zara aims to reduce both its stock holding in the supply chain and the risk associated with forecasting as product specifications are not finalized until closer to delivery. And so, um, but one thing that is, I, I do want to mention that Zara's does um, in its production um, is it, it uses a lot of the whole postponement strategy. And um, I discussed this briefly in the procurement section, but I do want to talk a little bit more about this. This whole idea of, for example, buying white cloth in bulk and holding onto it, and then right at the end changing it um, according to whatever the design specifications are. This is something known as the postponement strategy. And this is a strategy, again, that um, Zara's has, has been a leader in, in their supply chain. And again, this is a big thing that has given them an edge. And with that, I'm going to, I've reached the conclusion of this particular lecture. I hope you found uh, the Zara's case study um, interesting. And I look forward to uh, the, a question answer session with you on this case study. Thank you.